The following video presentation provides highlights from the 2013 Weston Disaster Preparedness Symposium held on June 18, 2013 at the Weston Community Center. The symposium was hosted by BSO Fire Rescue Weston and the Weston Community Emergency Response Team. Guest speakers were Dr. Rick Nabb, Director of the National Hurricane Center in Miami, Charles Lanza, Director of the Broward County Emergency Operations Center, and Weston City Manager John Flint. You will hear information and preparedness tips for residents and businesses applicable for any hurricane season. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Knapp. Hello, good evening everyone. I am thrilled to see all of you here tonight because that means you are engaged, you are interested, you are caring about your community. And that's what makes what I do, what emergency managers do, what people on television who communicate hurricane risk do all the more valuable because none of that matters unless the information, the warnings, the forecasts, the instructions from emergency managers, all that planning is taken at the community level and put into action. And so thank you for being here tonight. Uh, those of you who are actual CERT members, raise your hands. I want to see, that's fantastic. Let's give these folks a round of applause. <laughs> Why are hurricanes such a big problem? A lot of reasons. Fortunately, they don't happen very often in any one particular spot. Uh, and of course, we all think we're all hurricane savvy down here in South Florida, right? How many years has it been since a hurricane has hit Florida? And we're pushing eight. Uh, that luck is, is going to run out uh, one of these days. It's a matter of when, not if, the hurricanes are going to come back to Florida. Uh, I wish I had better news, but that's, that's the fact of life, of living in Florida. And, you know, folks often think, well, especially if you've moved to Florida since Wilma, uh, that, well, maybe the hurricane problem down here isn't as, as bad as uh, advertised in the past, but uh, the hurricanes are going to come back again. And uh, we, we have to treat every new hurricane season as if this is the year that we're going to be impacted. In fact, I was up in um, Palm Beach County and Martin County today talking to emergency managers and media, and the question came up, uh, well, how many hurricanes are we going to have this year? And if you could ask that question after hearing this tonight, I would encourage your answer to be one. We're going to have one hurricane here this year that we need to prepare for. Now, hopefully, we won't actually have it, but we have to prepare for that one. Because many people know this, but uh, when Hurricane Andrew hit in 1992, does anybody know how many total storms there were that year? It was less than 10. <laughs> it was a below average year. It was like seven total storms. One major hurricane the whole year, and that one major hurricane was a Category 5 hitting South Miami-Dade. Do you think anybody who went through Hurricane Andrew gives a flying frog about how many storms there were that year. It, it, the numbers just don't matter. And you compare that to a year like 2010, you know, like 19, 20 storms, whatever it was, not one hurricane hit the U.S. Uh, so it, the numbers don't matter, and how long it's been since the last hurricane actually doesn't matter at all, uh, because you can look at it both ways. Well, since we haven't had a hurricane in eight years, uh, our number must be up. This is probably going to be the year. Well, we don't know that. Uh, or, um, you know, it's, it's been eight years, so uh, maybe we just don't have this problem anymore. I don't have to worry about it. I think we're good now. New York gets the hurricanes now, right? Uh, that's certainly not something we can take to the bank either. So we have to prepare every year as if this is going to be our year. And people often ask, well, what do you actually do to get ready for a hurricane? Uh, and I can answer that question because I'm not just a hurricane forecaster, I'm not just a government manager, I am a resident of South Florida. I'm a resident of Weston, 
live right over in North Lakes. So I live the hurricane problem. Uh, I have a wife, have an eight-year-old son who just graduated from second grade. <laughs> <laughs> he's really proud of that. Uh, and he's doing very well going into third grade next year, but I've got a family and a home that I have to think about. What do we do to get ready for the next hurricane? And so I've got a very, very short list because sometimes people have a very short amount of time to uh, pay attention to what we say about what to do to get ready for hurricanes. So if we have just a few things to tell people, here's what I tell people. First, go shopping. This is not hard. We do it all the time, right? Uh, think about what it will be like if hurricane is approaching South Florida and at your house you have no extra water, no non-perishable food, no batteries, no flashlights, no battery-powered cell phone chargers, no first aid kit. While you don't think you need all those things today, all of a sudden, if a hurricane is a few days away, man, I really, really need those things. So you're going to go get in line with everybody else, stand in line for two or three hours for some of these things, and by the time you get to the front of the line, those will be gone. You know, it, it, it is so much easier to go get these critical supplies that we need both to get through the storm itself and for the potentially nasty and lengthy aftermath. We often forget that after the storm hits, it isn't so fun. If there's debris all over the place, if there's water covering the roads because there's flooding, if, the, if emergency vehicles can't get to where you are for a while, we really truly have to prepare for several days on our own where help might not come, depending on how bad the hurricane was. Power will be out. It could be hot in September. Remember after Wilma? It, was, it wasn't all that hot. We got kind of fortunate. Uh, it was a little bit cool, but it, it didn't last. Uh, my, it, being without the AC, even in October in South Florida, you know, not so fun. So go shopping. That's one thing I tell people to do. Uh, another thing is to find out if you live in an evacuation zone. Now, what I'm talking about is evacuation zones that are set up for evacuating the coastal areas due to the storm surge. You know, what storm surge, if you, have, if you haven't ever thought this through, because you know, out here in Weston, we actually don't have to worry about it. The storm surge is the ocean being pushed onshore into normally dry land areas due to the force of the wind pushing across the ocean. It pushes the ocean onshore. I've got some pictures from Sandy from last year to show you what that looked like in the most recent big storm surge event in this country. So evacuation zones are set up ahead of time to convey to people uh, what zone they live in so that when evacuations are instructed, they, they know that, that applies to them. And so I, I implore people in South Florida or any hurricane prone area to find out if they live in a hurricane storm surge evacuation zone. Uh, now, if, if you're a resident of Weston, that's not going to apply to you unless you guys change it today or anything. Okay. <laughs> uh, but here's what I would encourage all of us to do. Here's a, here's a challenge, an action item you can take away from tonight. Or if you're watching on TV, you can do this anytime. Identify a friend who does live close to the coast and make sure they find out if they live in a hurricane storm surge evacuation zone, whatever county they live in. They can find this out from their local emergency management office. And then if they do live in one of these zones, encourage them to, find, to figure out if they are ever told to evacuate, plan ahead of time where they're going to go and how they're going to get there. And while you're at it, Offer to them, if you live in an inland location that's out of these storm surge zones and you've got a home that is safe to stay in with the shutters and it's, it's a safe structure out of flood prone areas and is safe from wind, then be their evacuation destination. Because otherwise, people are going to be struggling to figure out, you know, where am I going to stay? A hotel? Am I going to go find a shelter? I mean, there are going to be shelters in such cases, but we can leave room for the people who really have no other option if we lend a hand to our friends or family that do live in the evacuation zones and encourage them that they don't have to drive to Orlando necessarily to get out of harm's way. Uh, you usually can just drive several miles, not hundreds of miles, uh, to get to a safe place out of the storm surge zone. So that's one thing that you know, we can all work on as a community and, and serve our our colleagues and friends and family that, are, that live in these, these coastal regions prone to storm surge. And finally, I know, are there any insurance agents in the room? Okay. Now, you, you, would, <laughs> you would probably agree with me that 
uh, on the list of things that people really, really look forward to doing, scheduling a meeting to go visit their insurance agent probably isn't at the top of their excitement list. But it is so important that you do so. Because you don't want to be one of those people, and again, spread this around, right? You don't want to be one of those people that gets a microphone put in front of their face after a disaster and is, you know, for very good reason, very upset because they've lost nearly everything and they don't have enough insurance. And in many cases, that could have been avoided ahead of time. You know, and find out if you have enough coverage for your home and its contents, your business, whatever else, your boat, whatever else you need to protect. Uh, having, having an insurance check is a really good thing to do. So these are tangible things to do. But what's interesting, though, is people often ask me when it's getting into hurricane season, they want to know about El Nino. They want to know about which model is the best. They want to know about uh, what, what's the situation with the satellites and all that kind of stuff. And I'm happy to talk about that, and I'll share a little bit about that with you tonight. But, but this is really what we ought to be doing. And this is what I'm doing uh, when it comes to my family. And we actually have a written document at the Hurricane Center that is our facility hurricane preparedness plan. And so uh, you know, spread, spread the word on, on tangible things uh, that people can be doing to get ready for hurricane season. Okay. Just to give you an, a, a little bit of an update on what we're doing new and hopefully neat at the Hurricane Center. Uh, I don't know how many of you spend a lot of time on the Hurricane Center's webpage. I don't, I, I don't have any uh, illusions to think that everybody in the world spends all their time on our website. Uh, my family doesn't. In fact, most people still get their information about hurricanes from television. Okay? So I'm not trying to convert everybody into an internet uh, you know, aficionado if that's not your thing. And if you're not into Twitter and Facebook, that's okay. Uh, but those folks who are, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but if you do happen to go to our website, and even if you don't, the folks on television are, and they're referring to this, we have this product called our Tropical Weather Outlook. And we issue this four times a day. My forecasters are working on it in a few minutes because at 8 o'clock tonight, the next one will be issued. And this product, it's a, there's a text version and there's a graphic, and we talk about what is out there on the horizon? What are the systems kind of brewing and percolating out there that could be our next tropical depressions and tropical storms? And this was just an example, one we issued on the 1st of June. Right off the bat, we had something to watch down in the southwestern Gulf of Mexico. That's not what became our first tropical storm in the Gulf a couple weeks ago. But, uh, but we have this graphic, and what, we, what we're talking about is the potential for new depressions and storms to form over the next couple of days. Uh, anybody familiar with the cone of uncertainty, the cone of death, the cone of doom, the cone of whatever? Okay. There are all kinds of renditions of this on television and across the internet. Uh, this is our version. Um, this is what, you know, let's pretend Hurricane Isaac from last year uh, happened in 2008. That's what the cone would have looked like because the cone is a representation of the probable area of the track of the cyclone. This is probably where the center is going to go, somewhere in there, right? Well, our forecasts are gradually improving. Our, tr our ability to forecast the track, where the center is going to go, is getting better year after year, better computer forecast models and so forth. Well, because of that, we're shrinking our cone, because the cone is kind of dependent upon how accurate our forecasts are. So that's what it will look like in 2008, but because five years later our forecasts have gotten a little better, the cone's shrinking. And so now in this particular case, Palm Beach County is all of a sudden magically out of the cone. Does that mean anything really important? Not really. Because the cone doesn't tell you whether or not you are going to be impacted or not. It's just, it's, just a, it's just showing where the center is probably going to go. But last year, not on this particular forecast, but on a later forecast, you know, remember Isaac, the center passed well to the south of here, right? Uh, went near the Keys and out into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and when it went out in the Gulf, we took the tropical storm warnings down for the southeast coast of Florida. Everybody was going, oh, good, another miss. And on that very same day, we're getting drenching rains in western populated Palm Beach County. Uh, it was a pretty devastating blow in a very localized area. You don't have to have the center of the storm to come over you for you to be the center of action. And I urge you not to think of the cone as the impact zone. Okay? It, it is definitely not that because especially for the big storms that we've been having a lot of the last few years, the storm's a lot bigger than the cone, and the impacts and the effects 
can extend well outside the cone. So you know, one thing we are very vulnerable to here in, in Weston, if the, if the rain is hard enough, is, is flooding. And we don't want to you know, let our guard down because we think the center's passing so far away that that couldn't possibly happen. Our local weather service folks will issue flash flood watches, and they mean it when they say that, that there's the potential for flash flooding. Uh, so uh, even though the cone's getting narrower, that doesn't mean we have narrowed down where the impacts are going to occur, because big storms can affect a lot of people. What we want people to focus on more than all those kinds of details that the forecasters are, are spending all their time fussing over is to focus on you know, what watches and warnings are we under in this location? What are the instructions coming from the emergency managers and city officials and county officials? That's what we want to focus on. That's what we want the residents of Weston focusing on during an event. There's a lesson to be learned from what some people were thinking as Isaac was approaching last year. A lot of folks thought, well, I got through Katrina, and where I live, it didn't flood. So Isaac certainly has no chance of getting me where I live. Well, because Isaac took a different track than Katrina and was still a large system, even though it was a Category 1, not as strong as Katrina, it flooded some areas that you see up here that did not flood in Katrina. And people are throwing their arms up going, how can that be? How in the world can wimpy little Category 1 Isaac flood where I live when Katrina didn't. That's because every storm is different. Every storm poses its unique hazards that because of the differences in the track or the size or the, the structure and how it interacts with the coastline and where it rains the hardest and where tornadoes occur, it can impact you in ways that previous storms never did. And so there's an example of what we can learn when you think of Andrew or Wilma for example. People might be inclined, if they went through one or both of those storms, to think, well, you know, we got through Wilma okay. Uh, I, I went through the, the fringes of Andrew, it wasn't so bad. You know, so if, if neither one of those storms got me, this one can't, right? This is only a tropical storm, this is only category one hurricane. We can't think that way. We have to keep our eye on the ball to focus on what are the threats to where we live in this next hurricane, this next tropical storm, because we might be the ones to get the worst of it. We can't let past experience tell us how to prepare for this next one. Here's a graphic we're working on. I'm almost done. I just want to give you a little peek into the future that we are now working on a graphic that probably will come out to the public starting next year. We, I might show something like this on television this year if, if an event materializes. What we're trying to do is show how far inland the water could penetrate due to storm surge from the ocean. This is in advance, this is a mock-up, this is not a real scenario. But this is a graphic for southwestern Florida. And if you have any friends or family over there, please urge them to find out if they live in an evacuation zone because the storm surge in certain scenarios can go 20, 25, up to 30 miles inland in certain spots. Not as far here in southeast Florida. But this is pick a point on the map and it tells you how deep the water could get at that point, accounting for all the uncertainties in the forecast. And, uh, this is something we're working on so that we start to graphically convey the water potential, the storm surge hazard. And we're going to, if we have a southeast Florida threat in the future, then we'll be putting out this graphic for southeastern Florida to show, in this particular case, how far inland could the water get in Miami-Dade and Broward counties in this particular case. And finally, if you want to continue the conversation, this isn't the last time we interact. Uh, Twitter is one way, Facebook is another. Uh, we, we at the Hurricane Center became active on both of these a couple years ago. And you might be saying to yourself, well, what about all the people in Weston and elsewhere that aren't into the social media thing? And why are you pushing this so much? Why do you think this is the solution to everything? Well, it's not. But it is more and more a way that many people communicate and rely on this method of getting information. And there's two other aspects to this. Even if people aren't active on social media, the television folks are. And they're monitoring what we are saying from the Weather Service, and they're monitoring what emergency managers and counties and city officials are saying. And that official, timely information can then go directly on the air to everybody who's watching television, the main way people get information. And on top of that, it's a way for all of us to reinforce one another's messages and establish mutual credibility with everybody else who's following us. Because let's say City of Weston on their Twitter account sends out some information about how to be more hurricane prepared. I'll retweet that in a second. And then we will be showing the public how we partner 
and that we are sharing the same mission, sharing the same message, and we, we reinforce the credibility of both organizations and showing that this is important from both perspectives. And all of you can use social media, if you're on it, to spread that information to the folks, folks who follow you. It can really be kind of a wildfire spreading this kind of information from official government sources. And so I encourage you to do that. So you can follow the Hurricane Center main accounts on Facebook and Twitter. The NHC Atlantic account is a good way to get notified instantly when a new product comes out from the Hurricane Center. A new outlook, a new advisory, special update of any kind. And the NAC Director Twitter account is the account that I utilize. If a tweet comes off of that account, it was from me. Nobody writes it for me. It's never automated. It's all me. That does, I can't do it all the time, but when I do, it is me. Uh, so that's just another tool in the box we have communication-wise. But you know what the best communication tool of all is? Just pick one person that you know really well, whether it's a family member, a friend, and help them on whatever aspect of their hurricane preparedness that they're either struggling with or just kind of procrastinating on, you can just do that in a very personal way to somebody that, that you trust or that trusts you to make hurricane preparedness the norm in our community. That's, I mean, all this, all this stuff that I'm talking about, all this technical advances and, and Twitter and Facebook and models and what we're saying on TV and what we're saying to, to the president, it, it, that, that's all important. But the most important thing is neighbor to neighbor, community member to community member, helping one another out, helping especially those who are less fortunate and less able to take care of themselves to be better hurricane prepared. So let's be a friend to others in our community and take a community approach to being hurricane prepared. And I'm proud to be part of this community. And I'll leave you with this. When I was introduced in my new job last June, the director of NOAA at the time, who has since moved on, so I can say this without worrying about my job. I'm kidding. <laughs> the, you know, at the time, I was introduced as the new hurricane director. And the first words out of my mouth when I had a chance to speak were, I am not the hurricane director. I'm the hurricane center director. And a lot of the gentlemen over here, when I walked in the room, said, you're going to make sure we don't get hit this year? I said, well, I'll try. But that's really not the part of my job that I'm very good at, OK? Uh, but I am going to try to um, do our job as best we can. We're all going to do that as community members. And I just am um, really proud to, to live here and be associated with all of you. Thanks for being here. And I'll turn it over to our next speakers. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you as the night goes on. Now, I know the National Hurricane Center and the Weather Service and AccuWeather, everybody has their own forecast. But for me, I've been using Dr. Gray's forecast for a long time because it usually has a lot of pop to it. When he comes out, the media tracks it, and the first thing they do, if it's a big forecast, is they come to the emergency managers and say, hey, what does that mean to the community? And that gives us the opportunity to talk to the community and say, these are the things you need to do. Because the only time I can talk to you is at presentations like this, or when the media comes out and talks to us and we're able to get the message out, or late in the time when the storm is at our doorstep, when the media finally says, oh, yeah, we haven't talked to them in a while. Let's go and find out what the message needs to be. So it's very difficult for me to get that message out to you eight times during a hurricane season if we don't have a real event. So we try to, to use every opportunity, and this is one of the big opportunities. And Dr. Gray has always been the one who has multiple forecasts, and a lot of people say, yeah, but the problem is he changes it every couple of months. Well, because the conditions out in the Atlantic, the the conditions with El Nino, La Nina are always changing, constantly changing. So what he's doing is he's updating it based on the most current conditions. Something that most of you don't know is the state is looking to do one way of I-75 for people to evacuate from east to west in, in the state of Florida. They also are planning to do it west to east. If you go out just right north of Weston right now, just east of US 27, there's a little roadway that crosses over from the northbound, no, to the eastbound, to the westbound. That's where they plan to redirect traffic to get it all going west or all going east. Now, we haven't practiced this yet. We've gone out there and we've taken a look at it. I'm assuming the worst case scenario, it's gonna be a major undertaking to get that many people to the west coast and then north. So a lot of those people might not 
make it all that way. So there might be some people that are coming into Broward County shelters, not because they wanted to, because they find no other way to get to the West Coast. So we're really looking at those numbers. So we're looking at 146,000 people on the, the coastal areas of Broward County that will have to evacuate in any type of a storm. We have a lot of people that cannot evacuate, a lot of people who need special assistance. There's people who have functional needs specifically, wheelchairs, oxygen dependent, people who need assistance with their activities of daily living. Broward County has a very robust program. And this isn't just people in the coastal areas. If you're oxygen dependent, you know somebody that's oxygen dependent. They should be on our, our special needs. We keep debating about what we're going to call it. The federal government wants us to call all this special needs stuff that we do functional needs support services. But that gets so difficult to say. Special needs population, we have a very robust program. But we like to pre-identify those people. If there are people in your family that need assistance with their activities of daily living, please notify Broward County at 311. Last time I was in a presentation in Hallandale, I said 411, and nobody caught it. It was just like, uh, I hate, hate when that happens. 311 is the county's rumor control or call center hotline. Either before, during, or after, that number will be up so you can call us. So we'd like people now who, have, who need assistance with their activities of daily living to be on our registry so that we can get all the paperwork done on them so that we know what their needs are. We'll pre-place them, we'll pre-identify where they're going to go, what shelter they're going to be in, and we'll identify transportation for them if they need it. We do have a pet-friendly shelter. One caveat, or two caveats. First one is you have to pre-register. If you have a pet, and you're going to go to one of our shelters. You call the Humane Society. Now, they have a different number than ours, but if you call 311, we'll make sure you get to the Humane Society to make sure your pet's uh, got a place in our shelter. Now, you can shelter also, but it's in the school next door. So don't be counting on hanging out with your pet during this. We have to keep them separate because there are people who are alert that it's amazing. They'll, be, they'll have a dog, but they'll be allergic to cats. So we've tried to make this as easy as possible it's a major undertaking by the government, by county and municipal governments to do this, but we've tried to make it so that nobody has an excuse not to go to a shelter. People were calling and saying, my house is destroyed. And we would go out to the house and we'd find out, well, it was damaged or it was heavily damaged. There was no objective way for the public to convey to us quickly what their house looked like. That's why we implemented the four pictures. We gave it to police and fire, and we also gave it to some of the residents, and now we give it to the CERT team members so when you call in the information, you say, hey, my house looks like number three. I know exactly what a number three looks like. You don't have to describe, well, there's a lot of roof damage and the doors are missing, the windows are missing. Now just tell me number three and I'll know what that means. That way we can send the right resources to the right neighborhoods. Unlike during Hurricane Andrew, we always sent maximum response to every call because everybody said my house is destroyed. So go to our website, you can download the pictures and now we also have the ability to do it on your, your smartphone, that's what we're calling now. Your Apple or your uh, Android phones, you go to our website, you bookmark it. If there's cellular service after a hurricane, all you have to do is go to, the site, uh, go to your phone, click on the, it'll look like an icon if you save it as a bookmark. You click on it, it will ask, it'll grab your GPS location from your phone, which we have the wonders of technology now, you have the ability to grab your, your GPS location, and you just tell it, my house looks like, it just, it's a click. There's the, three, there's the four pictures, you click on the picture that most resembles your house, and then you go down to the bottom and it asks about flooding. Flooding in my house, flooding in the street, no flooding. Click that, you push submit, and now it's posted on a map in the emergency operations center. That quickly. So we're able to quickly see, and we've tested it, spots show up in front of our eyes, yellow, green, and red. And we know that red are the heavily damaged ones, which means that we're going to need to send search and rescue. When you have a house that's heavily damaged, people are going to be trapped in the house. So we're going to send our first search and rescue teams out there. And we're also going to advise our CERT team members that they need to start going to those areas. So for the CERT members, thank you very much. And for those of you that need any assistance, 311 is the right number. We also have a vulnerable population registry. If you think you'd like to have People come out and just take a, an extra look at you or make a phone call to you after a storm or any other disaster. Notify the city, or actually you can go to our website, broward.org forward slash hurricane, 
and sign up for either the vulnerable population registry for your city to come out and take a look at you or just to help you out, or the special needs registry, which is if you have need assistance with your activities of daily living. And thank you very much. I'll stay around later for uh, questions. And uh, once again, thank you. It, it really takes a team to get us through any type of, uh, of storm event or disaster. And it's on the federal level, whether, whether it's Dr. Nab, on the local level, whether it's Chuck Lanza, who I've known for many, many years and we've uh, worked together well with, or here in Weston. And one of the things I, I thought I would uh, share with you is how we manage a disaster in the city of Weston. And just to give you an overview and an insight as to what's going on, how we're able to do it, and what occurs while you're at home preparing your house, and what we have to do to prepare our house. Some of the things I have to do is share a couple of responsibilities with the mayor. And the city, and the man the city manager and the mayor jointly, and, I said, and that's a key word, jointly have the authority to declare a state of local emergency pursuant to Chapter 252 of Florida Statutes. Neither one of us can do it alone. It takes two branches of government, both the executive branch, which is myself, the legislative branch, which is the mayor, to declare a state of emergency. So that way, neither party can go off on their own. It's got to be a joint decision for us to do that. Chapter 61 uh, addresses disaster access and debris removal. And the city, through its contract agents, will, will clear disaster debris from public and private rights of way throughout the city. For those who live in multifamily dwellings or townhouse communities, we don't go into private parking lots. We don't go into commercial areas. We don't clean up the private parks in your local community. We will only clean up the debris generated from residential properties that is put at the public right of way, period. That's it, because that's all we get reimbursed for from FEMA. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, is required for disposal separation uh, is required for structural and vegetative debris. They go to two different facilities to get disposed of. So uh, if you have, uh, you know, aluminum and things from your uh, the screen enclosure, don't commingle that with your other vegetative debris because the, the contractor will not pick it up. It, it has to be source separated. Okay, next chapter in the code is chapter 62 and it addresses storm shutters and uh, we always get uh, questions on this. Uh, at the time of closure, uh, on the code says when the city falls into the hurricane center's five day track forecast cone and for a period of 10 days after uh, uh, the city is no longer within that cone. Essentially, we really want you to put your shutters up in a timely manner, but we want them taken down as soon as possible. Keep in mind that if you, uh, when you look in your bedroom, there's a reason why your bedroom window is at the height that it is. It's a second means of egress in the event of fire or if the fire department has to get in to get you out of there. If the shutters are on the house, that's not a good situation for us to be in. Storm water management, we spoke of flooding and storm surge. Now we certainly don't expect to have any storm surge uh, here in Weston. We're far enough inland and I think we're far enough from the west coast to, uh, to avoid any of that as well. Uh, the city is divided into two basins, the Indian Trace Development District Basin and the Bonaventure Development District Basin. Uh, the Indian Trace uh, Basin has two pump stations located on the north bank of the C-11 Canal, which parallels Griffin Road. Uh, each of those discharge into the C-11 Canal. So everything from Bonaventure South and, and from 84, uh, where Indian Trace goes up to in the developments there, flows by gravity southward, uh, and it finds its way into the C-11 Canal. In the Bonaventure Development District, two pump stations are located at State Road 84, and they discharge under I-75 into the New River Canal. So all of that flows northward. We probably have one of the most sophisticated drainage systems of, of any community in Broward County, mainly because we were built under the most, the most contemporary engineering standards. So the question is, are you ever going to have any flooding on your street? Well, if the system works properly, I'd like to say the likelihood it's probably no. I will never say you'll never have that. But the one thing that can foul up the system is when you get debris over a catch basin. Okay? Then the street's going to flood and you're going to be calling us that the system's not working. Aren't you pumping? All I can ask you is, is as Dr. Nab and, and, and Chuck said, you know, adopt a neighbor a, a, across the county and, and make your home their refuge point. If there's a catch basin in, in front of your house, name it, adopt it, you know. <laughs> 
get friendly with it because, you know, it, if, it, if the catch basin is in front of your house, it's going to start creeping up your driveway first because that means all your neighbors halfway to the next catch basin are all higher. That st the street is higher there. Huh? So they're going to be the least likely to have a problem. So if the catch basin is in front of your house, you're going to be the first one to experience the problem. You're going to know it first. So, you know, get your waders on or whatever you want. Don't go out barefoot, please, but get your waders on. Get, you know, get your rake out of the garage, clean the catch basin off, and chances are all of a sudden the water is going to start to go down and in a short period of time we'll be in good shape again and it'll pump. All of the lakes in, in Weston and uh, in the Indian Trace Basin and in the Bonaventure community, uh, in each of the basins, they're respectively connected to each other. We do inspect the, the uh, culverts on a periodic basis. There are times that a culvert may get backed up. The likelihood of that with our robust inspection program is a lot less likely now than, than it was quite a number of years ago. So we're doing our best to, uh, to make sure of that, but when the lakes rise, it's okay. And if we get some standing water in the roadway, if it goes down in 30 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, that's okay too. Sometimes we get these deluges of rain and it's like a sponge. Once the sponge is saturated, it's going to spread out and overflow. The system can only take so much at a time, but it will move and it will move the water uh, aggressively. You know, we were very fortunate in, uh, in Hurricane Wilma that uh, the vast majority of the city uh, had electricity. We were out for maybe 45 minutes in most parts. Uh, there were a few parts of the city that were out for quite a number of days. And everybody thought, this is great. We had no interruption in, in power service because Weston predominantly has underground utilities. So we're good forever, you know, Dr. Nabby's telling us to prepare, you know, Mr. Lanza's telling us to prepare. Let me tell you, all underground power starts overhead. If the overhead load feeder lines go down or the substation gets hit, gets hit by lightning, it doesn't matter how many lines we got underground. We're not going to have power. So please, you know, because we got lucky once, and that's only because the substation in the Bonaventure on Saddle Club Road between Bonaventure and, and, and uh, the Indian Trace portions didn't get hit. Had that gotten hit, we would have been like everybody else. Uh, water service, uh, we all know our water service comes from the city of Sunrise, and that service is really dependent upon the electric service at the plants at Sunrise. Uh, and number two, trees not uprooting the water lines. When we get the big ficus trees or big oak trees, if they go over, they take a water line with it, we can have a water problem, okay? But for the most part, uh, Sunrise has, uh, has enhanced its, uh, its backup service on there, and uh, we should be, uh, be a lot better off uh, this year. Uh, that's just a picture of uh, Hurricane Wilma at Bonaventure Boulevard. And uh, Hurricane Wilma, depending upon who you ask, was a Category 1, a Category 1 and a half. We burned through $17 million for Hurricane Wilma. We spent $7 million on restoration. We got reimbursed for most of the 17 million from uh, FEMA, but FEMA does not play, pay for restoration. That was all on our money to do that. And if you recall, those of you who were here then, we implemented a three-year plan to get the city back on its feet. Okay, so where's all this money come from to, uh, for us to foot the bill for all this? Uh, within uh, the budget that we adopt for each fiscal year, there's a disaster management appropriation so that means there's money readily available. I don't have to call the, uh, a meeting of the city commission to access money to, uh, to get us uh, ready to go. Uh, there's a sum of money there. We also have a disaster management fund uh, that we uh, keep on hand. Uh, currently, it's at about $43 million. Uh, that is money that is ready to pay out. Keep in mind that the contractors that come in don't wait till we get that reimbursement check from FEMA. They send us invoices every two weeks. They want their money, they have to pay their people also, they have to buy fuel, they have to buy food for their people and all of those things. So you say it's a lot of money. Well, if you get one storm uh, you know, for that one year, it may be okay, but go back to 2005 when we could have had four storms. Uh, to back that up, we also have a standby letter of credit that we can go to the bank if we need to and uh, pull down on that. And our experience with Hurricane Wilma was our FEMA reimbursement took 24 months before the first check came in. So, you know, when, uh, you know, with, with uh, 
certainly no uh, disrespect to what the state is able to do and what uh, the county is able to do, do for us. We are really on our own out here, and that's how we approach it, that we've got to provide for ourselves. When and if help comes, it will be welcome. It'll be great. You'll see me doing cartwheels down Royal Palm Boulevard. <laughs> but okay, first, we, we've got to be prepared to help ourselves before any, uh, any more help can come in here. Communication is uh, certainly important, as Dr. Nabbitt said and, and Chuck had said, and we've got a number of ways that we're able to communicate with you. Uh, our, we call it our Weston Media Group. Uh, WestonFL.org is our Weston website. Uh, 1680 AM is our AM radio. And that you're probably going to have to be outside to get. It's tough to get AM radio inside. Uh, Weston TV is our government access TV channel on uh, channel 25 with advanced cable, which will continue after the advanced contract. And uh, Toby, what is it on uh, Comcast? And channel 78 on Comcast. Uh, Newsday Tuesday is uh, something great that we encourage everybody to sign up for. Uh, a number of years ago, we eliminated our quarterly newsletters, and instead we put out news 52 times a year instead of four times a year. Uh, so we call it Newsday Tuesday, and there's usually anywhere from uh, 8 to 12 articles there, and it's on our website, and it's there, new news every Tuesday. And it takes about four or five minutes to read, and you can get caught up on, on what's going on, and especially during storm events uh, for that. And that you can uh, just go to our website at westernfl.org, and you'll see on the main page, Newsday Tuesday. Now, the one thing that, that uh, we've started pushing this year is e-notifications. You can go on the website, or you can call us at City Hall, sign up for e-notifications, and we will keep you posted as to anything that's going on. And we do that throughout the year. It's not just during hurricane season. If there's a, a traffic jam on I-75 due to a major accident, you get an e-notification. Uh, we also uh, use uh, Twitter. Uh, we're on YouTube. And probably uh, one of the best tools that, that's uh, come around in the past decade is Code Red, and those of you that were here during Hurricane Wilma, we made use of that. Uh, the, uh, you know, as soon as the uh, storm event ceased, uh, we started with two calls a day for four or five days, got down to one call until uh, we were able to uh, get all of our cleanup done and, and keep everybody apprised of what was going on. And uh, let's say to, uh, to wrap things up, you know, someone will be first, someone will be last, but everyone will be cared for. When you see the contractors come into the city and everybody says, well, when are we going to get cleaned up? And how come they got cleaned up before we did? There are enough contractors in the world to come in and clean everybody up first. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, the contractor comes in, and depending upon the equipment that arrives first, and depending upon the damage that has occurred throughout the community, the contractor is going to match the equipment with the damage with the community. So if, he, if all the small equipment came first, he's going to go into the communities that have the tighter rights of ways, that have the higher density. If the big equipment comes in first, he'll go into the communities with the bigger rights of ways and work more, most efficiently and effectively uh, where the contractor can. Uh, it also is dependent upon uh, the rapid impact assessment uh, reports we get from fire rescue in the building department, the types of calls we're getting for fire rescue. Uh, in, a, uh, in a significant, in a major uh, storm event, we're going to make sure that the main roadways are cleared first, and then we'll start going to the main roadways in the communities to make sure we have at least one lane so we can get fire rescue in there, and then we'll get back into all the local roads. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, you have our assurance that everyone uh, will be cared for, and uh, that's really our objective in all of this. The, uh, the best thing you can do is, uh, is be prepared, as, as Chuck and Dr. Nab had told you. So that gives you a little bit of an in insight as to what, uh, how we do things, what we're able to do. Uh, we could probably stay here for another four hours and tell you everything but, that we do, but we certainly don't want to, uh, to bore you with that. That can be for another time. But I've got to tell you, it, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to be next to Dr. Nab from the, uh, the Hurricane Center and, and, and Chuck, who I've known, uh, like I said, for years. Uh, I, kn I know we can count on these folks, and at the end of the day, I'd, I'd like to be able to tell you that you can count, of all, count on all of us so that we can take care of all of you. Thanks, everybody. Make it your priority to be prepared, ready, and safe.